we're going to go ahead and get started again. Um, it is my uh, delight and honor to introduce to you Dr. Adam Lankford, uh, our next speaker. Dr. Lankford comes to us from the University of Alabama's Department of Criminology. I've been following his work for some time with great interest. His work on cross-national comparisons of mass shootings, characteristics of mass shooters uh, compared to folks involved in terrorist attacks. Uh, his work on indoctrination towards violent behavior, all of which uh, has had a, a profound impact on the work I do around violence risk management. Uh, he's worked with a variety of U.S. Uh, and international governmental agencies through the Department of State's Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. Uh, and late last summer, just two weeks before the Vegas incident, uh, his article, Don't Name Them, Don't Show Them, came out in uh, American Behavioral Scientists talking about media coverage of these types of events. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he transitioned from a bachelor's in English at Haverford to graduate studies in criminology. Uh, Professor Lankford brings a keen sensitivity to the role and impact of rhetoric, communication, and language on issues of violence. Welcome. Thanks, Jack. OK, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here uh, and uh, already enjoying the uh, fascinating presentations we've had so far. So uh, thanks to the previous speakers. So the title of my presentation is Reducing Public Mass Shootings in the United States, an Assessment of Firearms Availability and Media Coverage of Perpetrators. So I wanted to start off by talking about a study I did, I guess, back in 2015 that was published in 2016 on public mass shooters and firearms. And it had two basic research questions. The first was, how often do public mass shooters attack in the United States and elsewhere and in other countries? And then, how can the global distribution of these offenders be explained? In other words, why do some countries seem to have more public mass shooters than other countries? In terms of how I approached this, I started off with data collection on public mass shooters from a variety of sources, including the FBI Active Shooter Report, the New York City Police Department Active Shooter Report, uh, various prior scholarship and previous studies, and media reports. The goal was the inclusion of all people who committed these types of attacks from 1966 to 2012 who killed four or more victims. So what I was really looking at was public mass shooters, but these are essentially people who commit school shootings, workplace shootings, church shootings, theater shootings, mall shootings, and, and shootings in other public places. What are excluded are types of violence that are considered psychologically different, behaviorally different, domestic, gang and drive-by shootings, robberies, hostage-taking incidents, and organizational acts of terrorism or genocide. Really, those group acts. The data set ended up having 292 public mass shooters who killed four more victims. I ended up studying 171 countries. And to answer that first question, how often do public mass shooters attack in the United States and elsewhere? The finding was that 31% of offenders were in the United States. And so 31%, despite the fact that we have less than 5% of the world's population, clearly shows that we have a disproportionate public mass shooting problem, uh, far more than our share of the problem. So, you know, uh, Ed, when he was here, said, uh, you know, disclaimer, I'm going to show you some stats. And, you know, nobody gave me that warning to keep stats out of this presentation. So have a little patience with the next sl slide, and, and I'll walk you through it. Uh, so to answer that second question, how can the global distribution of mass shooters be explained, I ran a statistical test called negative binomial regression of mass shooters across nations. And really, this is a statistical test that is designed specifically for these types of data to deal with a skewed distribution where you have an outlier 
like the United States on the one hand, and then you have a whole bunch of other countries with zero, one, or two uh, public mass shooters at the lower end. In this case, the test was the, d the dependent variable. In other words, what I was trying to explain was how many public mass shooters does a country have from 1966 to 2012? And to answer that question, my independent variables at the top there were firearm ownership rate, homicide rate, and suicide rate. And then beyond that, control variables included population, sex ratio, meaning the, the ratio of men to, to women or males to females in a country, how urbanized the country is, and what that country's wealth is in terms of GDP per capita. So the findings were that, and I really didn't know what to expect going into this, uh, but the findings were that firearm ownership rate was statistically significant. In other words, overall countries with higher firearm ownership, more firearms per civilian, had more public mass shooters. And then not significant or not statistically significant based on these findings were homicide rate and suicide rate. In other words, there were countries with far worse homicide problems than ours and far worse suicide problems than ours, but they didn't have the same type of public mass shooting problem as we had in terms of severity. Uh, in addition, you know, not surprisingly, population was significant at the .05 level. On average, bigger countries tend to have more of these public mass shooters. Um, I ran two additional models beyond what I show up here to test the question of this relationship between firearms and public mass shooters seems pretty strong, but is this really just because of the United States and its impact on the data? And the answer was no. So if you withdraw the United States completely from this analysis, the relationship between firearms and public mass shooters is equally strong in explaining why other countries beyond the United States have more or fewer public mass shooters as well. So I did that study, you know, as I said, back in 2015, um, and, and honestly, it uh, got a lot of media attention back then. Uh, but then recently, the New York Times ran a, a feature that, that largely was based on my data November 7th, 2017, which was, you know, about a month after the Las Vegas shooting and a week after the Sutherland Springs church shooting. And they put, a, put together a pretty good graph that I thought I would share with you, even though I know it's a, a little tricky to read. Uh, at the top there it says, what explains US mass shootings? International comparisons suggest an answer. And on the vertical axis there, you have number of mass shooters, really public mass shooters, and on the horizontal axis there, you have number of firearms. And what it says there in the middle is the United States has 270 million guns and had 90 what should be public mass shooters who killed four or more victims from 1966 to 2012. Uh, 270 million guns is a low estimate, but it's based on really the source that's used by any researcher to make cross-national comparisons, which is the small arms survey. Underneath that, it says no other country had more than 46 million guns or 18 mass shooters, public mass shooters who killed four more victims. And you see, in terms of these red dots, in the upper right-hand corner is the United States. We're all by ourselves as a, as a uh, terrible, uh, I guess, extraordinary outlier. Uh, both in terms of firearms and in terms of public mass shooters. And then you see in the lower left-hand corner, lower left-hand corner, uh, even countries like China and India, which of course dwarf us in terms of their population, have far fewer guns than we have and have far fewer public mass shooters. I guess I would just also emphasize another way of kind of capturing this is the United States is number one in the world in public mass shooters by a lot. We're number one in total firearms by a lot. We're number one in firearms per capita by a lot. We're actually only, we're 48th in the world in suicide rate. So 
our suicide problem is nowhere near as, as much of an outlier as these other issues, and we're 92nd in the world in homicide rate. So that kind of gives a little more, is a different way of looking at this idea that it's not really suicide rate or homicide rate that explains why we have this public mass shooting problem to the degree to which we have it. Okay, so I would like to think and then on November 8th, just the next day, you know how, how the world works, in an alternate reality, we could imagine that the NRA acknowledged that firearms availability is the number one factor that explains our nation's mass shooting problem, that the United States Congress began working on a buyback program aimed at reducing firearm ownership, and that the president called for comprehensive gun control reforms, right? That's in an alternate reality. In our reality, nothing changed, right? And the issue, unfortunately, remains fiercely political and ideologically polarized. As just one example of this, a Washington Post ABC News 2015 poll asked people, asked American respondents, which should be the higher priority? On the one hand, enacting new laws to try to reduce gun violence, and 46% of respondents said yes, or the opposite, protecting the right to own guns, and the other 47% said yes, right? So it was almost 50-50 split among Americans, and do you feel strongly about your position? Well, at least we can agree on that, right? 95% of people said yes. So not only is the country split on this issue, but they seem entrenched on this issue. Uh, that was true in 2015. My sense is it, it continues to be true today. So, you know, to, to be frank, I'm not very optimistic about us making major progress on firearms availability in the United States anytime soon. But what I am more optimistic about is I think we do have a much more realistic opportunity for major progress when it comes to media coverage of these attackers. And so a simple question, would the media change their coverage of mass shooters to save lives? I think the answer, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I say here, media members appear more responsive to scientific findings, more willing to question their own approaches, and more open to negotiation than the NRA. Now, maybe that's a low bar, <laughs> uh, but I guess I would just mention not everyone is as optimistic as I am on that. I've talked to a lot of people, including some media people, who say, this is big business. Uh, the media will never change. They'll be just as resistant, just as defensive as the NRA is about admitting that guns play a role in mass shootings, just as resistant as tobacco companies are and were for decades about saying that their product caused lung cancer, just as resistant as the NFL is to admitting that concussions cause um, all sorts of uh, brain damage. I would like to disagree, and for now I do disagree, um, but ultimately, right, the proof's gonna be in the pudding, right? If the evidence is there, do we see change or not? Some of the reasons for my optimism are that media companies have already, rather than kind of completely squash this subject, have given voice to it. So the New York Times asked, how should the news media cover mass shooters? The Washington Post has said, another massacre, another media quandary, recognizing that this is a dilemma about what to do. And more pointedly, the Los Angeles Times has asked, are the media complicit in mass shootings? So I give them credit for having this conversation, and conversations are important, and we need to have more conversations, and I'm, you know, I'll talk till I'm hoarse, or listen till I'm tired, I guess that would be. Uh, but you know, at some point, conversations aren't enough, right? Um, we need action, we need change. I would also say that there is already, in terms of the Society for Professional Journalists Code of Ethics from 2014, they already emphasize that the media should balance the public's need for information against the potential harms 
In other words, they're not saying we need to report who, what, where, when, why, how, no matter what. They're saying we need to report these things and give the public information if the harms are not going to be significant. And in fact, to this point, the media already limit their coverage in important ways and typically do not publish, for example, uh, profanity, slurs, epithets, other offensive language, except in rare cases when the president says it, you know, and it's newsworthy. Uh, images that contain nudity, sexually explicit material, graphic violence, or corpses of the recently deceased. And as another example, names, of, uh, names or photos of victims of sexual harassment or sexual assault unless the victims themselves consent to being identified. So on this last point, I think of two prominent cases that I've actually written about. One is the Kobe Bryant rape case, where that was national news. It was a story that generated a tremendous amount of interest, and yet major media outlets, consistent with their ethics, did not publish the name and still have not published the name of the accuser in that case. The other case I think of much more recently is the Rolling Stones story, A Rape on Campus, in which there was a student who levied an accusation of gang rape at the University of Virginia, and despite the fact that this was probably the most media covered story for a month, major media outlets did not publish the name of the accuser. And so I think these things show that the media already uh, limits their own coverage, uh, tries to act in an ethical way. But what I would emphasize here is that these examples are important, but if we actually think about them, they're examples of the media deciding, in terms of potential harms, we're going to protect people from being offended. We're going to protect people from feeling uncomfortable. We're going to protect people from having their privacy violated. And although that is all important, I think the goal, to get back to the top bullet point I have here, of saving lives, saving lives is even more important than privacy, discomfort, being offended. Okay, so then the question becomes, is there scientific evidence that uh, current media coverage is putting lives at jeopardy and that changing it would make a difference? And the answer is yes, there is. And I'd like to share some of that with you. Consequences of media coverage of mass shooters. So the first type of consequence I want to talk about is something that uh, Russ touched on, which is the fact that the media coverage, it rewards many attackers with what they want, fame and attention. And you know, to some degree you already know this, but I did a study that was just published within the last week or so, uh, where I drew data from a, a, a uh, company that has 100,000 English language sources, uh, newspapers, television, online news, and much more. And what I found was that during their attack months, some mass killers have received more free publicity in dollar value than Kim Kardashian, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, Jennifer Aniston, and many other movie stars, TV stars, and professional athletes. Uh, and critically, this is exactly what many perpetrators have admitted was their goal. So someone asked Russ the question of kind of, well, what's the evidence that these people actually seek fame? Do we have that evidence? Uh, you know, fortunately, the answer is yes. I actually published an article on fame-seeking shooters in 2016 that specifically presents that evidence. So in that study, I document 24 examples many of the most tragic mass shootings in history in which there is direct evidence from the offender's own statements or from the offender's own actions in terms of directly contacting the media to become famous that that was a primary goal. So that is not speculation. I have those 24 examples. It's a small list. And I'm, and the burden of evidence or the standard for evidence in that study was very high. It had to be explicit evidence. In other words, there are a lot of other cases in which there's circumstantial evidence, 
which I did not include in this particular study. Also critical to recognize is that these individuals prefer negative attention to being ignored. So if you're a journalist and you're writing about a mass shooter and you say mean things about him, that's not good enough. Uh, you're still giving this person what he wants. Um, they are not under some sort of false delusion that the New York Times or CNN is going to run a puff piece about them or compliment them for their attacks. Uh, you know, as we've said regarding mental illness, a lot of these people are, you know, are not psychotic. They are aware of reality to a large extent. And, and I guess more broadly, you know, maybe if you have kids or pets or a puppy like mine, you know that sometimes wanting negative attention rather than being ignored is actually a relatively common psychological trait. Uh, and so we've come to this kind of terrible point in our history, although it's not inevitable and it can be changed, where if you're desperate to become famous, committing a high profile mass killing is your only guaranteed path to reaching that goal. It's your only guaranteed path to reaching that goal. And it's actually better than winning a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer Prize, better than winning an Academy Award, better than winning a Super Bowl, quantifiably in terms of how famous you become, at least for that month. But I guess most importantly, it requires no exceptional talent or ability, right? It just requires uh, the willingness to die uh, or face the consequences for your crime and, and kind of the desperation combined with the anger to go ahead and do it. Second major consequence of media coverage of mass shooters that I want to talk about, and I think this is something that Mark Fullman is going to talk about more later today, is that the media coverage of mass shooters actually incentivizes attackers to maximize victim fatalities. In other words, it incentivizes them to kill as many victims as possible. So there is unfortunately an exploitable correlation between the number of victims killed and the amount of fame and media attention received. For example, for the perpetrator, more victims killed means that there are going to be more front page photos of you in newspapers more days that you stay on the front pages of newspapers, it's more likely that you appear in the New York Times, and there are going to be more articles and longer articles based on their word count published about you. These are just four examples based on studies that scholars have done, things that have been measured. I certainly think this relationship holds up related to cable news, uh, TV news, and other forms of, of news coverage as well. So this exploitable pattern of media coverage is unfortunately common knowledge, right? You probably either uh, explicitly or implicitly were aware of it before I started talking today. Uh, everyone knows that Columbine, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, Las Vegas, that those attacks and those perpetrators got more attention because so many victims were killed. And if you all know it, offenders know it too. And just one example of that is the uh, 2015 UCC shooter in Oregon who wrote before his attack, when they spill a little blood, the whole world knows who they are. A man who is known by no one is now known by everyone. His face is splashed across every screen, his name across the lips of every person on the planet, all in the course of one day. Seems the more people you kill, the more you're in the limelight. He's right about that, 100% right about that factually, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? This is not some sort of inevitable thing. We can change the rules. The third major consequence I want to talk about is the fact that media coverage of mass shooters essentially provides free advertising for mass shooters that creates celebrity role models and leads to contagion and copycat effects. So if you actually think about it, if we wanted to increase mass shootings, we would give them free publicity, right? We would advertise them and we would advertise the people who do them. We would make these people into celebrities. That would be if we wanted to increase mass shootings, we want to decrease them and yet we're doing the same thing. So even dangerous products like uh, 
you know, Tide Pods, is that what they were, right? Even dangerous products, people and experiences, I'm not, don't get me started on dangerous people um, who've gotten free attention and ridden it to positions of power. Um, and experiences almost always garner more interest if they're widely advertised than not advertised at all. And furthermore, media coverage of mass killers inevitably leads to more people thinking about mass killers in both intended and unintended ways. In the same way that, you know, if I say elephant, I'm forcing you, many of you who are at least conscious, to think of elephant, right? And what you think about elephant, I don't fully control. Uh, whether you think, like, that sounds good for lunch, or you think, like, I'd like to go on a safari, or you think, why is this crazy person talking about elephants, right? So the, these two points, the fact that even dangerous products, people, and experiences almost always garner more interest if they're widely advertised than not advertised at all, and the fact that the media coverage um, leads to more people thinking about these things, but the media can't control how people think about these things, these notions are consistent with what we know about advertising and what we know about agenda setting from literally thousands of empirical studies. Okay, in addition, I'll emphasize that past copycat attackers have gotten inspiration from perpetrators uh, of Columbine, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, Charleston, and other shootings. This has all been documented. Uh, importantly, the imitators are not just copying violent behavior and tactics. The connections between celebrity killers and their imitators are deeply personal. The perpetrators are often worshiped as gods, heroes, kindred spirits, and sex symbols. This is not speculation. This is what you see when you look at um, the statements made by people who've committed these attacks and cited previous attackers as their inspiration. Let me put, put this a different way. The copycat phenomenon and the copycat behavior and the imitated behavior, these people are not copying the how, the details of how you do this, as much as they're copying the who, right? So when you think about what type of media coverage is most dangerous, it's not necessarily the details about how something happened, it's who did it. Uh, I guess more generally, I would point out that anonymous figures, by contrast, rarely become highly imitated role models. As a rhetorical question, do you have a role model whom you've never seen and whose name you do not even know? Probably not, right? And if, if you do, that person is probably not tremendously influential in terms of your subsequent behavior. So, what do we do about this? Okay, I've co-authored a proposal with another professor, Dr. Eric Madfis, and our proposal is called Don't Name Them, Don't Show Them, But Report Everything Else. Uh, this is also published as a journal article, which has the rationale and the scientific uh, basis uh, provided there. So the proposal is essentially that if the media stop publishing mass shooters' names and photos, that's it just stop publishing the names and photos, that would directly target all of the consequences I just presented to you. That would remove the reward of fame because these people no longer become famous as individuals. It would remove the incentive to kill as many victims as possible because whether you killed two victims or 69 victims, you'd get the same amount of fame, which is none. And it would stop the creation and the free advertising received by these celebrity mass killer role models. Now, this specific effort that I've been working on, I also have an open letter to the media, which has been signed by 149 experts, including Steven Pinker, who's one of the most accomplished psychologists in the country, uh, J. Reed Malloy, who, who some of you know does a lot of work in, in threat assessment um, and studying these types of offenders, and, and many other scholars as well. Uh, more broadly, this general effort has received support from law enforcement, including the FBI, uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which I always think should be chives of police, but you know, I gotta work on my grammar there, I guess. Uh, International Police Association is one of the um, other organizations that support this that, that isn't listed here. 
Uh, it's also received media support from notable people, including Anderson Cooper, Megyn Kelly, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, and more. Certainly a lot of other media members I've talked to personally. And I think there's political support as well, at least in terms of the public. So unlike debates about gun control, this seems to be bipartisan and apolitical. In other words, and there's survey research done by colleagues of mine that supports this point, that this is an area where Dem uh, Democrats and Republicans agree to a large extent. Okay, I wanna emphasize some things about this proposal, including that the proposal says don't name them, don't show them, but report everything else. All important details about these crimes could still be reported. Uh, we're saying go ahead and report the motives. Go ahead and report the backgrounds of these offenders. Uh, go ahead and report on behavior, on warning signs, all those things, the how. Uh, that's okay to report on. Just leave out the names and photos. So the names and photos themselves are not meaningful or preventative information. If you think about it, and this is kind of the epiphany I had when I started working on this, seeing the photo doesn't, you know, I see the photo and then I think, huh, and then I move on with my life, right? It's not an actionable uh, piece of information. So no one sees the photo and says, aha, that guy has weird eyebrows, now I know what to look out for, right? Uh, no one looks at the name and says, oh, well, Jack, or Jim, or John, people like that, with a name like that, are at higher risk of committing these attacks. Uh, so the names and photos are not meaningful or preventative information for the public to have, with one important exception, which is during an ongoing search for an escaped uh, suspect. And in fact, in those cases, law enforcement specifically disseminates that information because they want your help in finding the, the escaped suspect. Fortunately, in these cases, that is very rarely the case. I also want to emphasize that not publishing the names of mass shooters would alter media coverage by less than 1%. It seems like a big change, and maybe like getting over the psychological hurdle is a big change. In reality, it's a tiny change. You just simply replace the name of the, suspe uh, name of the suspect with uh, suspect or shooter, or if you're talking about a past case, you say, instead of saying the name of the 2007 Virginia Tech shooter, you say the 2007 Virginia Tech shooter. It's extraordinarily simple. I've been doing it uh, for a long time now. Uh, and the amount of actual words that change is tiny. I also want to emphasize that law enforcement and the media would still use these names in their investigations. Families, witnesses, and local communities would still know these names. This is not a call for some sort of government censorship. Uh, the names would still be known, they just wouldn't be in the headlines. Ultimately, this is an easy and low cost change that could save many innocent lives. So I did approximately somewhere around, you know, honestly I lose track, but somewhere around like 60 media interviews after the Las Vegas and Sutherland Springs church uh, shootings this past fall. I didn't mention the offenders' names once. I analyzed them in depth, right? I, I have the knowledge to analyze them in depth, right? More than most people. And, and it didn't inhibit my ability to have sophisticated discussions about this topic at all. It's low cost, there's no infrastructure cost, right? Just change how we operate, just stop doing something. Um, and it could save many innocent lives. Ultimately, I guess just looking ahead, I would say that I think this should be inevitable, it's just a matter of when. I think when we're talking to future generations, they're gonna look back and say, they're gonna find it hard to believe that we ever went through this period. And they're gonna say, wait a second, you used to give free publicity to mass shooters? And I'm gonna tell my grandson, yeah, we did. And he's saying, well, you must not have known that they sought fame, right? Well, uh, well, yeah, actually we, we did know that, but we gave them fame anyway. Well, but you couldn't have known that they killed more victims to become more famous. Yeah, we knew that too. And you knew they inspired copycats? Yeah, we knew that too. Well, why didn't you change? I'm hoping the answer will be, well, we changed relatively quickly. Um, and my sense is, or my hope is, that ultimately those future generations will just take it for granted as the new normal that we don't publish the names of mass shooters we don't publish their photos in a similar way that 
I take it for granted that cigarettes are no longer advertised on TV because of the public health consequences. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Can I cheat? <laughs> sure. So um, the first question is, um, you know, why does it seem that uh, white perpetrators' photos aren't uh, as broadly published as black perpetrators? I, why no photo of the recent Kentucky school shooter, um, even though we see photos of minors on TV every day? In fact, we were just talking about this one this morning. So. Yeah. So um, I don't have evidence on that, right? So I can't actually assert whether that's true or not. Maybe it is. And I think if you really want to assess photos of offenders across races, you might just break down the barriers, right? Look at all offenders in terms of violent, um, people accused of violence and, and crime rather than just looking at public mass shooters because you get different effects because you have more white public mass shooters than anything else. Regarding the, this Kentucky case, I guess it's a fascinating case to me, and Jack and I were talking about it this morning, because we have a minor who committed a school shooting. I believe he killed maybe two victims or three victims and wounded 18. And the media just ran stories about him before his name was released. They blurred out his face in terms of the video footage, and they just said the suspect, whose name uh, has not been identified, has not been released, and then they talked at length about what we know about the suspect. So I guess my point is this, this proposal is already in effect. It's just not in effect enough. It's very selective, and it's done to protect the privacy of the attacker when it should be uh, enacted more broadly to save lives. All right. So given the decline in trust for reliable, evidence-based media, how do we encourage promotion of hard scientific data over sensationalization, popularity on social media sites, et cetera, especially in regards to promoting more peer-reviewed literature with data instead of journalists and, and, and uh, lay people providing unsubstantiated opinions? So this is, I always heard to think of this as just the Monday morning pundits uh, on talk radio and uh, the news channels. So. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think um, Dr. McGinty is going to speak to that a little bit in terms of evidence-based um, coverage and, and the issue of mental illness. I guess my sense is um, we do live in a tricky time where media coverage can be both, it's sometimes f fulfilling the function of news, but seemingly of entertainment also, right? And the blurring of that can be troubling. But, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but the New York Times did run this stuff based on a peer review study. My sense actually is that the media are more eager for scientific studies than ever before. And they're more trusting of the public's interest in digesting academic studies. You know, we're becoming a society that cares more about information, whether it's predicting sports or predicting politics or anything else, analytics, right? Um, so I'm pretty hopeful in that regard. I'll interject, maybe invite them to a symposium on the topic. Just, yes. yeah. um, how does uh, media do follow-up stories and interviews with families and friends of the perpetrator in order to facilitate an understanding of the signs and, and warning uh, signals, et cetera, without also revealing clues to the identity? Uh, especially knowing that, you know, for, for media, there's such a financial incentive uh, to, to get the views, to get the readership. Um, uh, okay. So. I guess I would emphasize, I'm not naive. I understand that these names can get out there. And if you want to, you can look up the name of the accuser of, of uh, Kobe Bryant. You can look up the name of the person on Reddit or other sites um, of the person who, who uh, levied that accusation of gang rape at UVA, right? That information will be out there, and I don't think the media have to worry about it too much. The key is, don't put it in these major articles that give people the kind of fame that the UCC shooter was asking for. Having his names on the lips um, having his, of, of everyone in the country, of having his face on every, every television screen in the country, right? Keep it out of that, and I think that would be a major uh, step in the right direction. 
How do you prevent bystanders from posting uh, images of the shootings uh, if they're on Facebook live streaming or you know there's a mass shooting? You know, what are the pros and cons of putting that information out immediately in some of the live media formats that permeate in social media these days? Right. Honestly, I'm not too worried about that. Um, frankly, as far as that goes, you'll have some offenders who will publish their own information, right? Like we had the Roanoke shooter uh, who filmed his own shooting of a camera woman and a uh, cameraman and the anchor and posted it to Facebook, right? Facebook can disable that stuff. They actually did disable the, the Tide Pod videos, right? Uh, YouTube disables stuff. Uh, Facebook um, closes accounts. Uh, the only reason those accounts get out in the first place is typically because the media run a story about them, people read that media story, and then they click and, and find the original source of the information. Um, knowing that the names often get out anyway through you know, mass social media and less thoughtful press outlets, how do you balance that with what happens in the um, more traditional media? You know, I, I guess, I think that's a similar question, really. You know, I'm not that worried about it. I do think um, the key is preventing these people from getting the type of fame they want. In other words, uh, when a mass shooter is more famous during a month in terms of the advertising he receives than Kim Kardashian or Tom Cruise, that's a big deal, right, in terms of the influence. And if you look at the copycats, they copy the mass shooter just like they copy Kim Kardashian or Tom Cruise in terms of language, in terms of clothing, in terms of other elements of, of uh, celebrity worship. Um, I don't think just being like uh, getting some hits on YouTube or getting some hits on social media make you famous in the way that you cause national um, and international damage. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Linkford, thank you.